This is episode 21, the podcast where we interview leading CMOs, marketing, business, entrepreneurs, CEOs. And today we have a person who is all of that. His name is Lassai. He's the founder of Saxo Bank and also founder of Concordium. He also owns 25% of my favorite football team in the whole world, FC Copenhagen. Join us for a very interesting discussion about Saxo Bank and how Media Group helped market Saxo Bank from where it was to where it is today. We're still a client with him for 20 years. And also we talk a lot about blockchain and Concordium and where Lars sees the future lies on that. But what is also critically important and probably even more important at this stage is that we see a big inflow of people, of businesses actually wanting to use the blockchain. Nasai, it's such a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Nasai, you have such an... <laughs> An important history in, in the business and marketing. You've been in, involved in so many projects, but it goes back to 92 when you started Midas Bank, which would later turn into Saxo Bank. Um, that has, of course, grown into a big company. You ended up selling it later on. But I want to talk about some of those early years. Um, you started believing in the internet before many other people. What, what made you believe in the internet back then when people were very skeptical? Uh well, we we started uh, we started uh, Saxon Bank or Midas as a as a traditional brokerage because that was back in '92 when when the internet was really very theoretical. But uh, but we we spotted it relatively early on, like '94 '95, and made our first uh, just normal homepage around '95, I would imagine. And and uh, the, the reason we did it was that as a very young financial institution you know we were very far behind the sort of people we were competing with in terms of capital in terms of of offices in terms of, of resource uh, so uh, so when we saw this this new thing coming up we thought well maybe here's one place where, where actually we could be we could be one step ahead for once you know because if you looked at goldman sachs or citibank or anybody's early web pages they look like something you know you would you'd be ashamed if your kid came home from school with it you know so uh, so we thought if we did this right maybe that's one area where we could we could have a little bit of a of a level playing field at least so so it's kind of from that vision we said if we do this early and uh, then maybe that's a differentiator for us uh, and, and most people were very unaware of the internet or if they knew about it they didn't really believe in it were very skeptical i can't count the number of bank executives that told me that we were wasting our time and people always want to speak on the phone so uh, but we kind of had to believe in it because it was our differentiator and uh, and it turned out that uh, that it did work after all it sure did and it's this this mother of necessity that you have to compete in a different level with the big boys so that it certainly worked out so good on you so from a marketing point of view, you did the web page. How did you start doing marketing back then? Where you, well, you were pioneering in, in this new marketing space. What were your thoughts and ideas behind that? Uh, the one, apart from differentiating us, the other option that uh, the internet opened for us was, of course, going much more international, much faster than we had expected to. Uh, that those days we did mainly business in Denmark and a little bit in the rest of Scandinavia. But all of a sudden we. We saw this opening of many opportunities across the globe, uh, and uh, and that of course led us to think about how can we attract people not just from Denmark, not just from Scandinavia to this, uh, and uh, at the same time we had a, a very sort of narrow project product uh, when we finally launched our trading platform in uh, late '97. We did the first one, didn't like that too much, and then we we issued the subsequent Saxon Trader in in 98 uh, and uh, we we knew that trading foreign exchange was uh, a new market to most people because uh, it wasn't really available to to normal investors at the time because it would uh, it would uh, not be possible to service a foreign exchange client unless they had a certain size in the traditional manner with telephones you only have two two hands and two ears so uh, it was a very narrow product, and uh, we realized that if we were to find anywhere the needle in the haystack of people that uh, that could have an interest in this uh, online foreign exchange trading, which was our first product, then uh, we need to find a smart way to find them. And uh, I believe, seriously, we were some of the very, very first people to use the, the, the sort of the 
the pre-runner before Google Overture and, and looking with search words, etc. And we could buy wonderful search words at the minimum price of five cents at the time. So whenever people look for FX or Forex or foreign exchange, we were there for five cents, you know, and had it had it to ourselves for for like the first 12, 18 months before anybody else figured it out. Uh, so, so it was very much based on uh, on SEO uh, and optimizing our search words early on. Uh, we also tried a number of different formats, uh, including some that you probably wouldn't use today with, you know, blinking gray things yeah, that look like... Uh, yeah, look like machine operation messages and stuff, but you know, whatever gave a click through, we were happy with, right? Uh, and uh, so, so it was really a combination of this having a very dispersed client group that hardly existed yet, because we kind of built that 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 market together with a few other early movers, and secondly, uh, this ability to uh, to get around very very uh, cheaply on 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 systems like Overture, if I remember correctly, uh, and, and reaching out to areas which would otherwise have been impossible for us to approach. So, so that was also really very much online-based. We also tried to do some fun things where we differentiated ourselves, try to play on the fact that we were small and different and you know, had various uh, you know, banners with pictures of, of things that were evidently old school compared to something that was new school and trying to appeal to people, try something new and try for, instead of doing it the old fashioned way. And, and we did that uh, with, a, with a lot of sort of uh, uh, funny photos that would kind of underline this message. So you did the banner ads in the beginning, you did search engine optimization. And then later on, you guys did a bigger jump. You went into bicycling, Tour de France, uh, the, the, the Saxo Bank team. What, what made you go down that journey and how did that? improve your marketing and your awareness around the world was it cost effective from a marketing point of view or was it a fun hobby project that was a lot of it was it was it was very very expensive so uh so so it was definitely not a fun project uh for for something we did for a hobby in fact i didn't interest i wasn't very interested in cycling prior to that subsequently i i have become but uh but uh, that was definitely uh what we made a considered decision to Really the same problem, you know, we have been doing a lot, as I described, a lot of, of sort of uh, search search words and trying to find these people. But but that obviously didn't give you any general branding, uh, typically. So uh, so so uh, my, my partner, Kim, and, and I discussed at length, you know, given that we have such a dispersed user base, by, by this time we had maybe clients in 100 different countries, but very few clients in each country. Uh, we, um, we, we thought, how can we get better name recognition out there? And, uh, we, we kind of did a back of the envelope, uh, uh, calculation of what it would cost to do traditional advertising to achieve that in a hundred countries. And that kind of closed that discussion pretty quick. Uh, and then we thought, what if we took a major sponsor, uh, sponsorship where, where we could get known through that and we considered various sports. Uh, and, and I think as I still do today that, uh, Cycling is phenomenal if you want global exposure and you simply want brand recognition. It's probably not so ideal if you really want people to understand what you're doing, but if they just want them to know your name and, and you want a lot of people to know your name and then move from that so there's some degree of recognition, then uh, it's a very interesting uh, sport because it, it, it is global. There are obviously countries where it's more popular than others, but it's, it's a very global sport it uh, it has a lot of exposure because we probably had to, around 250 race days a year some of the big races like the Tour de France or the Giro d'Italia but many of them small races but but local races where we could then uh, target campaigns around Japan or Australia or wherever they happen to be on the sort of the, the world tour at the time uh, so uh, and then, of course, there's this thing about the name sponsorship that, per definition, and that, that doesn't really happen in, in, in many sports, but they take your name. So it's no longer team uh, recycling or something. It is team Saxo Bank, which means that subliminally, 
this brand gets repeated again and again and again and again uh, during many, many hours of viewing during a grand tour. I mean, you're never going to get Manchester United to call themselves uh, Saxon Bank United, no matter how much you pay them, right? Yeah. But here you actually get that constant name recognition. And I believe personally that that is by far the, the cheapest way to get internationally known. If you want to be very well known, in uh, in the UK, probably it's better to sponsor the shirts of, of Manchester United. But uh, but if you want to have a global just awareness of your existence, then I think cycling, and I remain of the view that cycling is by far the cheapest way to achieve that in sports, at least, and thereby probably also the cheapest way to achieve it full stop. Because wherever I go in the world today, people have heard about Saxo Bank. I mean, it, it, it is incredible, uh, the, the name recognition that we have. And, and that's got to be through, at least partially through that sponsorship. Obviously, we have a very international client base, but but there's no question that uh, that that helped us gain recognition. And the other thing that we were kind of fortunate with that in the in the seven or eight seasons that we sponsored Team Saxon Bank, uh, that became the sport of choice inside financial services. You know, they used to play golf and they ran marathons, but now everybody has a nice bike and, and they're very happy about it. So, uh, so the, the industry also got very interested in cycling at the same time. And I have seen multimillionaire hedge fund uh, managers uh, reduced to tears because I gave them a t-shirt and signed by a big cycling staff, you know, and that's a, that's a cheap way to get their, uh, to get their uh, uh, ever, everlasting love for, 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 because you give them a t-shirt for 30 euros with somebody's signature on it, right? That's a good point. And you ended up winning um, one Tour de France and a Shield Italia, if I'm correct? Or you... No, we, 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 run, we won everything. I don't think it's yeah. a major race. We didn't win through that. Uh, all of the major, all the tours, all of the majors, uh, world yeah. championship. I, I don't think there's a single trophy lacking in my trophy cupboard so uh, so i think <laughs> okay. we we can we can safely say we won everything over that eight year period okay um you were definitely an entrepreneur with a big capital e you started so many companies and to list them here would be would take a long long time we're going to talk about a few of them but <laughs> where do you see marketing as is it a is it a necessary necessary evil or is it an opportunity to brand yourself what's your your philosophy on on marketing both yourself, but also the companies you're involved with. No, I like marketing, and I always been quite closely involved, particularly in the early stages of Saxon Bank. I was pretty much running the marketing together with the the people that we were partnering with, which includes actually uh, you guys here uh, from a very early stage. We were engaging with maybe 25 years ago, I think. Uh, so, media group, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, with, with, with media group, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so. We, I, I always took a liking to it. I think marketing is interesting. I'm more of a salesman than a tech guy, uh, more of a business development guy than sitting doing the programming and the finer details of that. So for me, marketing is crucial. Uh, and also, of course, you can waste unbelievable amounts of money on bad marketing. So it's very important to uh, to try many different approaches, you know, and, and see what works and, and be pretty brutal about cutting away the stuff that doesn't work versus the stuff that works and uh, that that you know i think in the old days you used to say i know that half my marketing works i just don't know which half but the <laughs> internet changed that right and uh, yeah. and you actually did know which half worked right and you could cut away the other half and and i think that's what i like about online advertising in particular that it really gives you the opportunity at a very low cost to try very many different approaches and and then you can optimize what has potential and you can cut away the stuff that clearly doesn't work at a relatively early stage before you have spent millions of dollars on a campaign. That makes total sense. And especially if you're buying at a five cents uh, a search word, that's uh, definitely cheap. <laughs> yeah, those search words were probably 50, 100 bucks today. So that was a bit of a gift in the early days. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely a lot more competition now. So fast forward, you're selling Saxo Bank. You are now free from Saxo Bank, this company that has you've been with for almost 20 years. Um, you start looking into blockchain. I know there's a story about you. You bought a lot of Bitcoin at one point and you lost that. And do you want to talk about that story a little bit first about Bitcoins and how well, you got into that? And then we can talk about Concordium. Yeah, first of all, I would say I 
been 26 years in Saxon Bank, so so uh, it, it took a great deal of, of my life. So I think I paid my my dues there. But ultimately, towards the, the latter years, I didn't think it was as much fun as it was in the beginning. I thought it's uh, drowning in, in regulatory uh, conversations all the time. I mean, I think some of that regulation is absolutely necessary and, and was badly needed. But but today, running a bank is like 80% regulation and 20% customer service and new projects, right? And, and that just doesn't appeal to me to spend my time that way. You know, I understand the need for it, but I don't understand why I have to do it, right? So, uh, so, so in the end, I, I thought that was just becoming too big a part of it. And and uh, wanted to move on. So I sold my, my last yes, you know, took some money off the table along the way, but sold my last bigger chunk in September 2018. Uh, so so then I moved on. I mean, I had started investing in various other projects prior to that because, as I said, we took some money off the table every now and again, and Sex Bank was very profitable. Uh, this were the days when a company had to be profitable to actually be successful. This doesn't seem to be the case anymore. But... Uh, <laughs> But but we always like to to also have a bottom line to show. So I had the opportunity to invest in various things along the way, and uh, and one thing I spotted again relatively early on was Bitcoin, uh, probably in 2012 or something like that, which which is early days in, in Bitcoin, and, and that was perhaps due to some of my more ultra libertarian and anarchistic friends that kind of liked this new French project, uh, and I liked it uh, immediately because it kind of reminded me a little bit about a normal currency, of course, and as that was the mainstay of our business, certainly in those days, uh, I thought, well, maybe this could be something we could also trade the same way as we trade the dollar or the yen and offer it to our clients. So uh, unfortunately, that vision never came to happen because I, I couldn't really convince my own legal of compliance people about it at the time. Uh, uh, even though I was the CEO, I, I simply never managed to to get us in there, which is a bit of a regret uh, because I, I we were so much earlier than everybody else. I mean, I actually personally convinced uh, my then chairman uh, about the, the validity of this space so much so that he became the president of uh, of Coinbase afterwards. But but uh, we could have been Coinbase years before nobody had even thought about it. Right, uh, so. Mm-hmm. So that is a little bit of a frustration, which is also why I'm, I'm quite keen now to live out uh, my own visions in that space and, and focus very much on blockchain and, 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 and that whole area. Because I, I think it's the first, uh, it's, a, it's the most important transformative technology I've seen since the internet. In fact, it reminds me quite a lot about the early internet days. And uh, I waited 25 years to see something that was equally interesting. And this time I want to be all in, you know, uh, and, uh, and and trying to be that. Because when, when I spotted the internet, there were actually a lot of other stuff than sex and bank I would have loved to be part of and invest in. But I was using 24-7 on, on sex and bank of my own capacity, and I didn't really have the money to invest in various other projects. But, but this time around, it's a little bit flipped. I have some time on my hands to actually investigate things and I have some money to invest. So I'm going quite broadly into the blockchain space at uh, this time. Yeah. And before you started Concordium, you also invested a little bit. Of, you bought some Bitcoins and the story is you lost some of them. How many Bitcoins do you have? If I may ask. Yeah. How many did you buy? yeah I, I bought some for fun early on uh, just yeah. to see how it, how it worked and whether you could actually use it anywhere and hoping to get a gin tonic or a haircut or something for yeah. my Bitcoin. But uh, Never really found any use for it. So I and, and it was a small amount of money at the time. So I didn't really think much of it and didn't back it up. And lo and behold, for the one and only time in my life, I lost this damn phone in a swimming pool and uh, I simply was unable to recover it. <laughs> you know? uh, but at the time, it was probably only 20,000 bucks. So I didn't pay too much attention to it. But I guess today it would probably be in a couple of million. So I should yeah. I should have spent a little bit more time trying to recover it but that's what it is that's a fun story and uh, yeah. subsequently i i invested a little bit more in it and this time on the other hand i had learned the lesson which was probably yeah. good because this time i bought a separate uh, a separate uh, 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 iphone for it i i took the, the backup very carefully i locked it into a bank box for several years and only when I wanted to liquidate that position, I went back in that in that uh, safe deposit box and took it out. So maybe, and that was a slightly bigger amount. So, so uh, maybe it was good that I got my learning in the early days with my uh, with my for fun my for fun early investment. That makes sense. So 
you launched uh, last year Concordium, a project you've been working on for the last three, four years, or maybe even longer. Can you tell us what Concordium is? It's a blockchain that, that can service many different <laughs> there are many different applications, many different things. And I understand you have about 75,000 registered users already. Well, I mean, uh, much as I like Bitcoin and subsequently Ethereum that I also spotted uh, very early due to my friends. Uh, actually, before they launched, I went to see them in they're sitting down in Souk, like 20, 20 guys in a, in a villa down there. Uh, so... So I kind of like that. And of course, Ethereum had a very important innovation, which was a smart contract, which meant you could actually do more than just sit and transfer a currency back and forth. Uh, but I also got increasingly concerned about uh, the things that had originally attracted me, the, the anarchist of it and the, the, the freedom of it, because much as I like those things, you also have to be very realistic and you get very realistic when you've been CEO of a, of a retail investment bank for, for more than two decades. Uh, and, and, and what is the reality here is that uh, there's not going to be, although many people like to think it, but there's not going to be a planet blockchain where you can just do whatever you like. Uh, if you want to get this mainstream, there's going to be regulation, there's going to be laws, there's going to be uh, accountability. Uh, and, and I felt that was sorely lagging in some of the early generations. Now, that doesn't mean there can't be a space out there for people that want it like that, but it's never going to be achieve mainstream adoption uh, for, for serious businesses. And I do believe it has a lot of, of opportunities for, for big businesses and big corporates to use blockchain. Uh, so, so in order to to bridge that gap, because of the problems about the early generations are several, you know, the anonymity, which is just a no-go in, 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 in real business today. The lack of scalability it was generally pretty poorly built tech as well, nothing like what we were used to from, from the bank. Uh, and a whole range of problems that, that I thought, if, if we don't solve this, if we don't find a solution to this, I don't think this space is going to be what it could be. And that's a little bit like the early internet when you're sitting with a screeching modem in the background, took half an hour to download a picture. You know, you had to, yeah. you had to do things to get this into, into something you could actually use. And the same thing with blockchain. Uh, so I, I, I sat down and thought long and hard about if I'm going to do another blockchain, and there was probably a couple of thousand of them in late 17 because it was kind of all the hype, right? If I'm going to do blockchain number 2001, there's got to be a reason, right? Uh, and, yeah. and the reason for that is to build a blockchain that can be comfortably and safely uh, used by by both big and small businesses, but but with a certainty that they have a they have at least the option to be compliant and uh, and to ID their underlying users, right? So so. And of course, it needs to be scalable. You know, Bitcoin can do seven transactions per second. Ethereum can do 15. I mean, uh, Visa yeah. in a peak hour does 25,000, right? So it's never going to, with those rules restrictions, uh, it's never going to be a big mainstream thing, right? So so I set out to solve solve those issues. And we did that by introducing an ID layer at the protocol level, you know, so you can't actually access the system unless you go through an ID uh, process and, and that doesn't mean that we display your ID everywhere. There's lots of privacy, but we do know that the person behind it is Thomas or Lars, right? That that that's what we know with certainty. And and that actually you don't even know on Facebook or anywhere else today. You you have lots of people doing fake profiles. And we as I said, there's a lot of privacy around it. Uh, that that this works in the way that there's a little pointer on your account that's showing back to where the identity can, under certain stringent rules, be be established uh, and held accountable. Uh, but what you have on your own wallet uh, when you do the account is that you have all your ID data. And that means that if somebody asks you for it, for example, a use case that says, well, I need to know this about you, Thomas. I need to know how old you are and where you live and, and, and what and that this is your name. You can choose to give him that information. Uh, you can also choose not to do it, but then he can choose to say, well, then I'm not going to do business with you uh, because, of course, ID is a private thing. But if you do choose to give that information, he knows with 100% mathematical certainty due to some cryptographic proofs that what you're saying is the truth. So you cannot claim to not be Thomas or to be uh, living uh, in a different country or to have a different age. You know, So... 
the, the, the beauty that we introduced also, actually relatively simply, this is more an ideological decision than some of the advanced technology we're building. But you can know with certainty who you're interacting with if that person chooses to give you that information, if you want to do business with them. If he, if he does something very bad and he chooses uh, not to do it, you also have through legal due process a way to find him. Uh, but, uh, but the real purpose here is for people that actually want to engage with each other and be sure about who they, who they are dealing with. Because I, I think you know we will have a self-regulatory type function on this blockchain because if you want to do something bad or something that you know there's 9999 other blockchains where you can be anonymous so i think you, you have to be pretty damn stupid to choose concordium for it right so so i think it will also have a self-adjusting mechanism in that sense right yeah so but what i really need to explain here is that Concordium is what we call a layer one, a foundational blockchain. You know, it's not just a use case or something fancy or a little game or, or, or solid use. It's a, it's a foundation. Uh, if you should do a parallel, this is the internet. It's not Google or Facebook or Amazon. It's, it, it is this fundamental infrastructure for a blockchain economy. And that's very hard to build. It's actually nice. Uh, and thanks God for that. It's not very difficult to build an application on top of a of, of a layer one blockchain, but building the layer one blockchain itself is extremely complicated, which is why we we spent years doing it with the best cryptographers in the world and uh, with, with a corporate tech process, you know. So so it's a very serious project to, to be part of the infrastructure in this future economy. And I would say uh, it's not something that a thousand people are doing. There's maybe 10 serious attempts at building that. And and here I'm being very kind. I actually think it's less than 10 that could conceivably be used for it. But but let's say there's somewhere between five and 10 teams seriously working with this at the moment. Okay, that makes uh, total sense. You mentioned before that Bitcoin had limitation with seven transactions per second. Ethereum has 15. But also one of the challenges with Bitcoin is that it's very power consuming. You have to mine. You have to... these processes uh, requires a lot of power and as they get more and more complicated because the chain gets longer and longer it takes longer and longer and requires a lot of electricity and some countries are now banning or shutting down mining completely because it takes up a lot of electricity how is concordium doing it how, first of all how many transactions can you do from a scalable point of view and also does it require as much electricity as bitcoin no, that's very true. That that's another very significant problem. I don't think it was seen as so much a problem when when Bitcoin was sort of yeah. uh, the white paper came out in two thousand eight, and obviously the thinking behind Bitcoin goes back decades. You know, it's just old wine on new bottles, right? In fact, some of our lead scientists have have invented some of the core core uh, units that make up a blockchain, like the hash function was invented at Aarhus University in nineteen seventy nine by. Uh, our chief advisor, right? So this is all wine on, on new bottles, but uh, but I don't think that it was really a concern. And there's a lot of arguments for using this lot of electricity because it, it kind of gives you a it gives you a solidity that that some work has actually gone into creating this. It's not just something you're printing down in a basement, right? Uh, and that would be the argument for this. But of course, the narrative and the whole understanding of that space has changed completely in the last decade. And you're absolutely right that, uh, that that this high high electricity usage uh, is completely incompatible with the narrative of a modern business, right? I mean, most businesses spend now a lot of time explaining and also doing a lot of stuff to be sustainable and be absolutely uh, accountable for everything that they do. So if you if that's your whole narrative, you can't turn around and say, oh, by the way, I'm I'm building that on a blockchain that blows off the energy of Argentina at the same time, right? It just doesn't make sense. So that is a very serious problem. That is solved, uh, not just by us, actually, by, but by most modern blockchains using what is called proof of stake. The other thing is called proof of work because you have a lot of computers working uh, very heavily to, to gain this lottery. In proof of stake, it's different. You, you put up your stake as a guarantee for not corrupting the system and, uh, and, and then you occasionally get the win the right to win the block, which is in essence what this is about. So it's also much more democratic because if you have 1% of the system, you get 1% of the rewards. If you get a tenth of, of a percent of the system, you get a tenth of a percent of the rewards. Whereas in Bitcoin and Ethereum, 
all of the money is going to big mining operations that have uh, huge numbers of computers and access to the cheapest electricity. In the old days, you could put up a computer and you could actually occasionally win a Bitcoin. Today, if you uh, made your home computer try to compete for a Bitcoin, I mean, you would win one in a billion years, right? So, uh, so our proof of stake, apart from not using anywhere near the energy, I mean, it's infinitely small part of that. Uh, also, it's much more democratic in that if you actually invest in the system and you're involved in the system, you get your fair share of the rewards. In terms of the electricity use, of course, uh, any process that, that uses a computer has some footprint. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, 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 I mean, like a millions or billions of Bitcoin or something. But the little that there is, we actually offset. So it's a net zero, uh, it's a net zero platform, right? Nice. Um, so... Concordium, you it's been taking you years, as you said, to develop, develop it, and it launched uh, last year, uh, late last year. How do you, from a marketing perspective, how do you prepare that launch? How do you start telling people about it? I was surprised to hear that you already have 75,000 companies or people registered to use the infrastructure that you have built. But how do you market such a new thing as A, when you say there's thousands of other uh, currency out there, but how do you split apart? How do you, what do you do? Well, first of all, we didn't actually, because when, when we, what, what you do is you run a series of what we call test nets, where where you're testing and testing and asking people to, to really try to find bugs and push your heart, and you're still running test nets even after you launch the actual product, so people can can try new functionality, which is obviously being uh, added to the platform all the time. We have a roadmap years into the future, um, but. Um, uh, but after having run four or five test nets, I think four, we then lost what's called the main net back in June. And we did uh, very little marketing for it because we didn't want people to use it. We want people to, we wanted to see ourselves that it worked the way that we, we thought it should work uh, before we actually did any marketing because this is critical infrastructure, right? We cannot, we cannot uh, ask people to use this uh, piece of infrastructure and then it blows up in their face a couple of years later, right? So uh, so we actually wanted to be sure that this thing works. So by now we minted close to 2 million blocks. Uh, so, uh, so now we have a great deal of confidence in that we have got something solid here. And then we started marketing and actually the vast majority of those accounts came in December. We haven't done any marketing prior to December. So, uh, so I'll say we got 70,000 new users in December. Uh, and, and that, of course, is, uh, is, is promising because uh, promising for two reasons. One, that there's an interest out there. And two, which was always my worry, given that we go through this little extra hurdle, it's not enormously onerous, but you do have to identify yourself. You do have to sit with your passport or driver's license or an identity card. You do have to go through a biometric check. What if people don't want to do that? Maybe they're so used to making an anonymous account on, on, on Ethereum in a split second or making 100 anonymous accounts if they need to do something that requires a... Um, would that be a major hurdle? And, and thankfully, it doesn't seem to be the case. We've had uh, very little, if any, pushback on the ID function. In fact, people seem to like it because while it's a little extra hassle for themselves, it takes a couple of minutes if you're prepared, uh, then I think the benefit of knowing that everybody else does it uh, is probably what makes people actually happy about it. So, so, so that has been very nice to see. And then, of course, it's very nice to see that people are interested in being part of it. But what is also critically important and probably even more important at this stage is that we see a big inflow of people or businesses actually wanting to use the blockchain because at the end of the day, if you just have people fooling around, sitting, sending tokens to each other, yeah. you know, that can go a long way for speculative purposes and have gone a long way for some, some of the early generations. But at the end of the day, five years from now, the blockchains that will exist, and uh, here I include the Bitcoin and Ethereum, will be blockchains that that have business and 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 that serves some meaningful purpose other than speculation, right? Mm, that makes sense. Can you just for people who are still grasping what blockchain is, can you come with examples some of the customers? Maybe mention a customer or some company now that is using it and explain how they're using your infrastructure and how it helps them and how how you both rely on each other. 
Well, a blockchain is a very simple thing. People like to think it's very complicated, but it's actually very simple. If you imagine you have a bit of data going back and forth in a system, every now and again, we agree to say, well, let's just, let's just draw a line in the sand here, and let's just collect the data that came in the last, in Bitcoin's case, last 10 minutes, in our case, last few seconds, because they need to be run much, much faster, these blocks, uh, than, than in the Bitcoin system. Uh, Let's collect all that and let's agree that that's it. And then you have the nodes, as they're called, various uh, people with a special piece of software that support this. And, and, and they agree that uh, this is the data for the last few seconds, right? Yeah. <clears throat> then you put that together in a block. You may leave something out that will then go into the next block, but, but all of it will eventually get in there. Uh, so, so we agree this block. We have this proof of stake lottery. Who gets to actually mint the block? Because you need to have a leader to like saying, this is the block. And then they get a reward for that, which in Bitcoin is Bitcoin, and in Ethereum is Ether, and with us is CCD, the Concordium token. Now we agree that. Uh, let's uh, make sure that we save that data for eternity. You do that by running it through something called a hash function, which is a complex mathematical calculation that always end up in a, for example, a 60-digit code. So whenever you put that data in, you're going to get that code. If you change anything to the data, you're going to get a completely different code. And that is what secures you that what's in there is, yeah. in fact, the stuff that we believe is in there because mm -hmm. the code you then put, that, that goes in the bottom of the block, if you will. Uh, and then the same code goes in top of the next block, which is the chain part, right? That you link the blocks together in that way. Uh, and, and that's all a blockchain is, you know? Uh, yeah, that's what it is. Well, data I, we agree on, hash it, put it into the next I, block, uh, and you secure your data. It's very, very simple. I understand that. I was just making, if you could talk about maybe some of the companies that is using your infrastructure to see how they're using it for what they're using it for, just to give an example. I would add two things to, to that because I think it's important to understand what you use it for. Then you have a token, which is yeah. because the normal payment system doesn't work. If we could pay people US dollars to do this work uh, of, of agreeing the block immediately and they had the money like that, we could use US dollars. But we can't. So because it will take three days to settle, right? Uh, and it will cost an arm and a leg to send small amounts back and forth. So we have a token. And finally, we have uh, the, the smart contract idea that you can put a little algorithm in. And that's very important for understanding what the use cases do. A little algorithm that does something and gets automatically automatically executed as the blockchain progresses. Those are the five things. The block, the hash, the token, uh, the consensus mechanism, and the smart contract, and that's a blockchain. It's, uh, it's that easy. Now, the smart contract is the key to most of it, and the token also, uh, in that the smart contract is in, you can tell that to do anything. And in contrary to a human being, uh, it always does, the, you know, uh, even if you make a million dollar extensive contract, you can't be sure. In the traditional world, you can't be sure that people will actually do what you agree. They can just ignore the contract. But if you build an algorithm, an algorithm does what you tell it to do. So if that tells you, you know, if uh, if this guy has a code to the apartment, I'm renting him, uh, well, then I want money every first of the month from, from this smart contract. And if I don't get it, the code gets changed and he can't get into the apartment, right? <laughs> That's a simple example, right? And NFT, uh, which is very much flavor of the month, you can link, you can link a, a, a piece of virtual art or some other thing to a specific token. Uh, that token is then unique because it has this particular link in it, and uh, it's saved in, in a completely immutable data system. So whoever owns that token at a given point in time also owns that piece of art, if that's what it is, a piece of music or whatever, right? It could also, so, so these are simple things, but, but very, very highly efficient because it registers ownership in a way that realistically is immutable, which we don't know. I mean, everybody can go in and theoretically fiddle with a database or change a written land register, or maybe you don't even have it. So these, these uh, completely immutable registrations are very, very important. That could also be that if you have some data in your business, and this is a big use case, I believe. You have some data in your business that you need to prove potentially to a regulator, or to to an investigation, or for a customer that at that point in time that data was exactly like that. And I have guarantee you that I haven't fiddled with it. Then you can stick it on a blockchain, and it stays there, and you cannot fiddle with it. Or at least you know if you had right. Uh, so, uh, so this is. Uh, 
These are very, very simple functions, but but of I mean, extreme importance because they they give the trust between parties that not only you have to spend uh, lawyers and, and and times and public sector registers, etc., to establish all this. Here, you you know who you're dealing with. You know they're going to do what you agree because they can't do anything else. And at the end of the day, this is bigger than you think because if you, uh, I, I, I heard somewhere uh, that up to ten percent of world GDP goes into industries which primary function is to establish ownership, except uh, establish that you can trust the other party, uh, which which means uh, the whole legal sector, of course, the financial sector to a large extent. Otherwise, we could just have our money lying around in, in our sofas if we <laughs> trusted people, right? Uh, and, and to a large extent, many public sector registers, etc. Uh, here, you, you solve all that. Uh, so of course, it's not as easy as that, but, but basically, you cannot do business with people where you only know what you're required to know. You know that that person is not lying to you. You know that that person is going to do what you agreed to do, which is huge. I mean, I, I believe having been in a business with a lot of with sort of uh, execution ability due diligence, not just on, on identities, et cetera, but like banking sake, we spent huge sums of money securing that some remote broker would actually be capable of paying us when they had to and, and, and we could trust them to do so. This is gone. You know, if you agree something, uh, it happens. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I actually honestly believe that there's more business not getting done in the world today due to those kind of concerns and the the the, the, the practicality and, and and money that goes into establishing that trust that is actually not worth it for many small transactions. Yeah. So there's probably exactly. more business not being done in the world today than the business being done. And, and that is what we will unlock with a properly designed blockchain. We'll unlock that huge amount of business that doesn't get done. And then we'll make the rest of it very, very much safer than it is today. Exactly. So, yeah, let's talk about NFTs, which is the slave of the month, as you said. So Space7, that's a company that is you have that is running on the blockchain, right? Where artists can go and upload a digital fan art and people can buy the fan out and then own it uh, on, on the blockchain. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a platform for uh, for digital art primarily. Will also be collectibles in the longer run. But right now, it's for people that uh, that like to work with digital art. And I've I've been collecting art for three decades. Uh, and a lot of artists actually like the idea of working with new media and 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 you know uh, digital art has been a, has been a, a case for for many years even without nfts but now you actually have also the ability to take that digital art establish with certainty the ownership of it being certain if you transfer the ownership that you get paid for it and even which appeals to a lot of artists being able to build in a future license so whenever that artwork gets sold again you will receive like a 10 or 15% commission back if, if, if you put that in a smart contract. This is a big concern for many artists that, you know, they, they, they sell some great works when they're young and unrecognized and they sell them for a beer in the local pub, right? Uh, yeah. 20 years later, it gets traded for 5 million bucks on Sotheby, right? But yeah. they get nothing out of it. In theory, they should actually get a little bit out of it, but mostly they don't. Here, they can, they can, they can forever uh, continue to get a fair share of any any realized gains that somebody might have on their art subsequently uh, by reselling it. So that's one of the many functions. But uh, most importantly, I think, actually, it's a new medium for many artists, uh, many artists that are innovative and searching for new opportunities. So here, there's one way to do it. And, and then on top of that, have a completely solid uh, transaction mechanism underlying, at least in Space 7 and Concordium, because there's a rampant fraud on some of the big platforms out yeah, there. Absolutely. People stealing artworks and selling it. But here, you know with certainty that it comes from the artist uh, if you choose to to check that up and establish it, right? Uh, so, so I think uh, there's a lot to be said for it. And it opens also entirely new markets to artists because the people that are buying NFTs, these are not the people that go down, uh, you know, that go down Dover Street in London and, and, and uh, you know, go into the expensive galleries. This is young people that see art completely differently and have actually money to spend because many of them have made a, a lot of money on crypto. So it yep. also unlocks entirely new markets and, a, and opens for a much closer contact to those markets because now actually 20 years down the line, you know where your works are. Most artists have no idea where their works are sitting uh, 
10 years after they made oh, them, right? Uh, true, I'll, I'll really create, it's an enormous tracking mechanism, at least to do so. But uh, but here you have a much closer relationship. You can also go back to those people if they allow you and say, well, you bought that. Now I got another one. Would you be interested, right? So I, it's a fantastic use case. And what I like about it is that uh, it's the first one, maybe apart from Bitcoin speculation, if you can call that a use case, but it's the first one that actually reached out to the mainstream. I mean, people that are not nerds, people that are not particularly interested in in, uh, in in blockchain and crypto and all that, all of a sudden they can collect art, they can collect football cards, they can do stuff that they begin to see the meaning of, you know, because yeah. before they thought, what is this weird stuff? I don't want to sit and send a, a monopoly money back and forth. But now they can actually see the value. They can also many people that come from the gaming uh, environment that, that, you know, here instead of buying, you know, an extra sword or a nice uniform, well, you don't know if that guy's printing a thousand or ten thousand right here. You know with certainty that if you buy a, something specific, it's yours, and 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 maybe it's there in a hundred copies or whatever people chose. But then you know it, right? Uh, or maybe it's unique, and then it is unique, right? Makes sense. Um, talk about some of the other companies. I'm not going to go through all of them because you have invested in a lot of them. But I'm very peculiar about because of the. Corona, which seems to come again and again and again, and we're never going to get rid of. But tell me about UV Medico and and what it does, because I was very interested in that. Well, it is also extremely interesting. Uh, it uh, it it's uh, it's actually a well-known technology. Ultraviolet rays kill viruses. This has been known since uh, yeah, more than a hundred years. Uh, the famous Danish. Uh, scientist Finsen got the Nobel Prize in 1903 for making uh, this point. Uh, so this is not new, uh, and hence it's also very well known and very well established inside the the regulations of that. So it's not a pharma product in, in the way that it's basically a ray uh, light product. Now the interesting thing is that you also also use the ultraviolet light for many years to sterilize operational theaters and stuff like that, uh, yeah. and, and and known as a sterilization mechanism. But until uh, recently, it is also harmful to people being in the room because of the particular chosen wavelength of ultraviolet of the ultraviolet light, i.e., typically 254 nanometers to be specific. But if you do if you do ultraviolet light at 222 nanometers, it still has exactly the same effect on viral, but it has uh, no negative impact on uh, on humans in the room. And this is uh, extensively documented from science. Uh, so actually, now you can have these lamps. You can know that there's no corona, there's no influenza, there's no virus whatsoever, but you're not harmed by it. So so in any highly traffic room, you can basically you can basically exterminate the COVID, right? So it's a brilliant uh, product. Uh, and I'm actually surprised that it hasn't got a little more traction than we have, but it's beginning to come. There's now four four Danish hospitals using it and some major corporates that want to protect yeah. certain areas. Uh, but, and but, uh, so so it, it's a brilliant product. And, and, and yeah. it's a, instead of running around with masks and 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 cleaning liquid you know this this is so much easier and, and certainly a part of the solution like technology is always part of the solution so let me ask you there if we can go back to the marketing aspect so you are an investor in this company and there's of course other people working there you might even be a minority investor but how do you go on in these times when there's a product should be everywhere how do you market that and what's your approach to marketing when it comes to this product, what's your thoughts and what's the company's idea for doing that, UV Medical? Yeah, first of all, that's probably part of the issue is that we haven't marketed that much. But there's also a good reason for that is that it's a very, very complicated process. So we don't have an awful lot of these lamps, right? Uh, we can probably deliver a 1,000 inside a month. We can deliver 10,000 inside six months. But it's not like we can do millions of them, right? Okay. Uh, so so, so, so you, you don't necessarily want all of, all of uh, Europe to call up and say, I want <laughs> one of those at home, because then we can't deliver it and the marketing is wasted, right? So this is more targeted. This is more with salespeople. It's not, it, it does cost some money too, you know? Uh, so so it's not necessarily a mass market product, but it's very obvious for hospitals, for old old pensioners' homes, for waiting rooms at dentists and doctors and stuff like that. Uh, so, so it's a little more targeted. 
And it's mainly been done by, by a physical sales force also because it needs an assessment of the room, it needs installation, etc. But space, that being yeah. said, uh, we, are, we are now beginning to ramp up production and we need to get it out there much more than, uh, than, than, than we've been doing so far. Uh, but it has also been something, you know, if I had a million of them to sell, then I would probably uh, have taken a very different approach. But uh, but we'll get there. And, and the great thing is it really is a solution to a lot of these problems. And particularly if you have very exposed areas or, or very vulnerable people, it's a no-brainer. You know, to be honest, I just installed a couple in, at my mother's home uh, where, where she's, in a, she's in a pension home, right? And uh, because I don't want to at a high age to 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 get that kind of disease, and uh, I, I think that's uh, that's uh, a very very obvious use case. But but right now it's 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 installed in multiple hospitals, which is probably more more convincing than me putting it up at my mom's place. But uh, and and also we have a very interesting story which I can't release. But actually, it probably you say this is only being sent in a couple of weeks. Yeah, but we have the World Cup and. We have the World Cup in handball uh, in, a, in a few uh, days starting, and, and obviously everybody's uh, absolutely freaking out about getting corona for their players. So actually the Danish handball team are bringing these lamps to the tournament to uh, protect, the, protect the players, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting and probably quite visible use case when that comes out. That's good. Yeah, and this will launch at a later time. So yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Lars, you got many investments and you have invested in several restaurants. And in fact, some of the best restaurants in the world are on the top 10 list are in Copenhagen now. One of them is uh, Geranium. The other one is Alchemist. I know Geranium has a three-star Michelin stars, which is the highest you can get, the highest order you can get. But there's a story about Alchemist you want to you wanna talk about. Well, uh, Geranium is a very accomplished, uh, long-established restaurant. Three Michelin stars, you say, currently uh, number two in the world on the top 50 list, which, which of course, we're very proud of. Alchemist is a newer project. It's actually on, on the list as well, which, funnily enough, although it's called top 50, it's a list of 100, but it's number 50 uh, on the top 50. So... But that's a very new project, and, and we certainly expect that to go high on that list as people get to know it. But the interesting thing is that this is a majorly hyped restaurant. I mean, everybody wants to go there. We have currently a waiting list of 35,000 or something the last time I, I, I saw it, and people coming from all over the world. And and when we built that, it's been very expensive. It's very technology-based, and, and it took a long time to build. So it's a completely different experience, I'd say, to any other restaurant in the world. But still, having spent you know the better part of fifteen million dollars on it, I was like, oh my god, what if people don't like it? Right, <laughs> that would be that would be real bad news. But from day one, it was completely sold out, and and now getting more crazy every quarter, right? Uh, and and that's interesting because that actually we never did any marketing for it. It, it just went viral. People were so excited about the why do you the, think that is? Few few pictures that we released, it got a little bit delayed that wasn't on purpose but you know took longer time to build and require more investment uh, but but we kept it very secret what we we're going to do out there because it really is so different that we didn't want all of the sort of gas to go out of balloon before we launched right so we were very secretive we kind of hinted a little bit at what it was going to do it got delayed everybody heard about there was a lot of investment in it and all of a sudden it was globally known i would say this restaurant is super hyped and i have people I never heard about writing me from all over the world saying, oh, could you get me a place on this if I come to Copenhagen, you know, which unfortunately is difficult, right? But so so that's interesting how reality can also work without any uh, instant uh, or any sort of specific marketing budget because we did very little of it. And, and, and of course, after we launched, then people are so excited about it that, that literally everybody that goes there uploads tons of photos on social media and and gives away some of the secret sauce, but 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 uh, but that just that just drives this enormous hype about a restaurant like that. I seriously think it's the most hyped restaurant in the world today, and with some justification, it is a unique experience. But uh, but that's been entirely run by people being excited about it, uh, sharing their experience, pure social media strategy, which actually we don't really even interfere with. You know, of course, we have our own. Instagram page, but but it's not like uh, we're going out to the foodies and give them pictures. They they do that all by themselves, and and nice. I would say there are mi millions of people out there that would have heard about Alchemist now without us actually having done a 
any any much anything much in my in terms of marketing to to get to that point which i don't know if the is a message you want to hear if you're selling advertising right but, <laughs> but nevertheless no but that's, nevertheless, that's, good. that's uh, a great story it, can it you get to the point that uh, yeah. proves the point that virality if you can think that into your marketing because of course you can you can help virality along the way but virality itself is uh it's really fantastic if people just share it because they want to share it, right? That that's yeah, they need some little more help perhaps sometimes to have the right things to share, etc. But thinking virality into what you do is of course also critically important. But that's but that's also because it's a great story and it's a great theme and people can share it as an experience that people are sharing. That's that's good. I gotta ask, uh, can you get a table when you're in Copenhagen? <laughs> uh, is that possible? I'll, or I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll see. Uh, I'll but not see for me. I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> No, I'm asking how. How I would not for me. I'm asking you. How can can you get a table at the when you're in Copenhagen? Uh, I'm well connected, but even I sometimes, <laughs> if if I uh, if I say I want it next Friday, I can't get it. You know, but really, but, uh, <laughs> but, but there will be uh, there will be uh, maybe a little more leeway for me, and also. Yeah, you know, course. if you really want to ask me for a table, don't give up. But if, but, but don't I'm not ask asking for a table. I'm not going. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm all I'm the way saying, in Australia. I won't be in Copenhagen for a long I'm, time. So. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying in general to people, uh, friends, and that if you really, really, really need a, a table for a good business associate or something like that, let me think about it. But don't uh, what I can do, but don't do it because you you just want to go there with a good mate of yours every Friday, then you can forget about it, right? <laughs> exactly. Last, we're gonna all, we're gonna round up, uh, but I gotta ask one question here at the end because I'm a big Copenhagen FC Copenhagen fan, and for some people might know my know this, but you own about a, a quarter of the club. So the big question I gotta ask you is: Are we going to be champions in 2022? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a uh, we we that's definitely the target for the season and, and Champions yes. League qualification after that. Okay. Uh, we have a great. Great, 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 great set of, of young kids coming up from our talent academy. Really fantastic, you know. Which, which uh, we, we we had eleven players debuting of our own ranks this this first half of the season. Eleven, that's unheard of. It was partially because we had some injuries in that, which of course are not so great. But uh, but to have eleven people debuting on your first team in a in a reasonable league is is unheard of, right? But. Now it's the transfer window, as you know, here in January, and we're gonna see if we can find a couple of experienced, good players to to help these young kids along together with the ones we have already, of course. But we're very, very, very positive about the the future, and uh, I think we'll do it even this year. Yes. Good. That is so good to hear. And yes, amazing young players coming up. It's it's just wonderful to see and follow, and uh, it makes me very happy that uh, the future is set, and hopefully we'll be champions again. It's been a couple of years. We are dying for it. Yeah, it won't be long. And we, yeah, we will do you. our utmost to make sure it's this year. Thank you. Lars, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for taking your time to be on Memorable Marketing. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was such a pleasure speaking with the last from Memorable Marketing. Um, it's true. Media Group, we help do the marketing for Saxo Bank. and still doing for Saxo Bank 20 years later. And we help build... A company through marketing. Obviously, Lars is a very talented man, very entrepreneurial, and obviously he had a great product and a great idea, but we helped execute that from a marketing point of view. So if you're out there and you have a company, you have an organization that need marketing, contact me and I would love to chat to you about how we can help. Now, that being said, if you're a regular listener, a regular <laughs> viewer of Memorable Marketing, you will know that at the end of each episode, I bring in Zane. And who is Zane? Zane is our producer who sits in the background and makes sure we sound good, and maybe not look good, but he makes sure that the technique at least is working. And the reason why being insane is also, it's always to have a good little chat about what he thought about the interview. As a lay person who knows nothing about anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about Lars and what he's doing and what he's up yeah, to? Yeah, I mean, Lars is such an interesting person. Like I, I understand that he's a very well-known person. Uh, identity in in Denmark and in Europe in general, but again, being this little island to the south of Australia, like we, we don't know anything. Uh, <laughs> but I think entrepreneurial is such a great way to describe Lars because he really has a grasp of like social marketing. Um, just from what he was saying, like the value of repetition with the sponsoring of sports and what have you, with the the Saxo Bank yeah. uh, cycling team and and what have you, but then also the value of hype when it comes to his restaurant at the very end, where it is 
if you give people something that they want to share, they will do the marketing exactly. for you. And that's a very entrepreneurial way yeah. of uh, dealing with your marketing. But of course, again, at the very start, when he was talking about his work with Saxo Bank, he's like, yeah, I have an idea of what I want, but then it's really good to hand it off to people who know what they're doing to actually handle it, handle the programming and, mm. the, and the data analysis and that sort of thing. So I guess that's where Media Group kind of comes in. So uh, I mean, yeah, Lars is a very interesting person and what he was saying about the uh, the landscape of blockchain and how it's evolving in a similar way to how the early days of the internet evolved, yeah. whereas the internet was a very misunderstood tool to begin with and then it's become this kind of, uh, well, really a necessity everyday in everyone's everyday yeah, we, life, yeah. You know, when service break down, the whole our life stops because we can't book an appointment, we yeah. can't go to a dentist, we can't, <laughs> our car will stop work. I mean, everything is just so interconnected now. We're just, it's just part of everyday life. Yeah, and the opportunities that really... Um, that blockchain 2.0 really presents is like, yeah. yes, there will always be a place for the anarchist libertarian side of yes. blockchain where it's all anonymous and it's all handled how it is right now. And there's still websites that just work on HTML and work the same way as they always have. Yeah. But there will be uh, blockchain 2.0 and blockchain 3.0, which kind of bring it into the mainstream, bring yes. it into a, yes. a tool that becomes every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Lars is such an interesting character. Obviously, from my from my country, I'm from Denmark, so I have known of him. I've never spoken to him before. So I knew a lot about him. But and and he's very entrepreneurial and he's starting all these things. And I only mention not even half of all the companies involved with. And but it's just interesting what he does. And in the beginning I was a little bit critical of Concordium because I didn't understand what it was. Because mm. I when I saw it first, when I was you know, compared to Bitcoin, of course, and Ethereum, where you're more anonymous, and I thought that's the thing. But his background is in banking, and his background is in regulation, understanding that. He said 80% of his work was about understanding regulations and living up to those regulations. And he sees a future where blockchain will go a little more mainstream. In order to go mainstream, it needs to be regulated. It needs to be yeah. transparent. And I think he's ahead of the curve here. And I think he's got onto, he's onto something here where anybody can use this blockchain to verify transactions forth and back, whatever it might be in whatever industry you're in. So I think he's onto something and I think he's building next uh, Texas Bank. And one thing I wanted to ask him, and I had so many questions, but of course we're running out of time, was he mentioned earlier in a different interview, he said that he, the CCD, which is the coin that he, the, uh, token, the yeah. token he's talking about, he said he want to put it on stock exchange that people can go in and buy and sell it yeah. there as a share. Yeah. So that's very interesting to look out for. And so if people out there, I'm not recommending or <laughs> speculating. I'm just saying, watch that if that happens, because yeah, I think it will take off. But what a pleasure, man. What a guy. And what's very generous with his time and just, just want to share his, his thoughts and his beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Super interesting person. Oh my God. Yes. All right. Thank you, Zane. You're welcome. We'll see you in the next one.